Sailing out of Littleton Harbour on the coastal oil tanker Kakariki, I'm continuing my circumnavigation of New Zealand, following the wake of James Cook and his ship Endeavour. By February 1770, Cook had charted the North Island and was now mapping a new coastline, which Māori had told him was also an island. However, many on board the Endeavour hoped that this was part of the great southern continent they'd been sent to find. So Cook and crew sailed on into some of New Zealand's most unforgiving waters. I have to follow. I only hope my friends here bring me luck. Captain's Log, 17th February, 1770. Yesterday, Lieutenant Gore thought he saw land, but I, who was upon deck at the same time, was very certain that it was only clouds which dissipated as the sun rose. Not wanting to be accused of leaving anything unexplored, Cook set a course southeast. We, however, are going the more direct route, from Littleton down the coast and up Otago Harbour to Dunedin. Kakariki is the largest New Zealand registered ship and carries a variety of petroleum products. She's uh, not so much a ship as a gigantic bomb. <laughs> yeah, I guess the older type tankers were more of a, a bomb. Um, what we do, on, especially in the newer type tankers, we pump what they call inert gas into the tanks as we're discharging the products. Yeah. It takes out the oxygen content, takes away that's one side of the, of the fire triangles. The problems of being a tanker master these days is the, the emotive aspect of when any you do have an incident, environmental incident, you know, it's a, yeah. they tend to sort of blame the, the tanker master and lock him up somewhere. Oh really? There's some pretty horrific jails around the world. <laughs> <laughs> nothing goes over the side these days though. No. Yeah. It's amazing what used to go over years ago and it was all legal. One of the Kakariki's smaller cargo tanks has been emptied and cleaned for repair. Its capacity is 1.2 million litres. It's a heck of a long way down. Out of the 22 tanks, we have four this size, then we have four more double the size again, and four more double double the size again. Oh, so they, they're quite big, but we can carry 45 millimetres all up. Watch the bottom step, Pete. Okay, the reason we're actually down here is, as you can see, we've got some of our engineering staff working on one of our pumps. Normally, we wouldn't come down here apart from once a year. Oh, okay, just once a year? Once a year from inspection and a clean. That, right. That's about all. The rest of the time, because the ship works so often, it's, um, it's in full use all the time. Right, yeah. Silverfern Shipping Limited is New Zealand's only oil shipping company, and each year its two tankers, Kakariki and Taiko, carry nearly two million tonnes of petroleum products from the Marsden Point refinery. Oh yeah, it's all fun and games on the bow till somebody loses an eye. I'm going somewhere much warmer. how big the engine was. They said it's a really big six-cylinder engine. Really big. I mean, it's um, this is the top half of the engine. Over here is the piston. It's one piston. How's that? An engine that takes up three and a half stories. This is the propeller shaft, and this big thing here that you see revolving around weighs two and a half tons, and it needs it to drive the propeller, which is five and a half metres in diameter. Huge numbers on this vessel, huge. By now, Cook was back from chasing Lieutenant Gore's imaginary land. Just north of what he named Cape Saunders, there seemed to be a sheltered harbour. He noted it, but he didn't go in. 
He was on a mission to discover whether this was actually the great mythical southern continent or just the South Island of the North Island that he'd already charted. So he pressed on. We, however, are going to go up the harbour, up the long, narrow, winding Otago Harbour. And in a ship this size, let me tell you, it's quite a trip. Because of its length, the Kakariki must come in during the day and with a local harbour pilot on the bridge. Also on the pilot boat is maritime historian and author Gavin McLean, who's written extensively about Otago Harbour's long and often convoluted past. It's a story of big business, political intrigue and major construction, such as this kilometre long structure off our Moana called the Mole. This is basically protecting the entrance to the channel that will take us all the way up to Dunedin City. Its main effect is to keep the sand which drifts along the coast out of this expensively dredged channel that we're now entering. Expensively dredged? Yes, they've been dredging this for well over a century. The whole secret of a harbour like this is keeping one really deep channel in one place. Right. The harbour was crucial to the Free Church deciding on Otago as a colony site in 1848. Dunedin was built on flat land at the upper end of this long, flooded river valley, and thanks to the gold rushes of the early 1860s, the city became a centre of commerce and industry. But the upper harbour was very shallow. The deep water berths were near the entrance, here at Port Chalmers. Its supporters on the Otago Harbour Board bitterly opposed the spending of huge money to dredge the Victoria Channel up to the city wharves. To Port Chalmers people, the channel was simply known as the Big Ditch. This is a really big complicated harbour. It's not only got an upper and a lower harbour, but it's almost divided in two by the Portobello Peninsula and these two islands. Now this should be very interesting. So this is threading the needle. That's it. You can see how very close we are on either side. We're perfectly safe, believe me. <laughs> but this is the tightest part. This is really where the length restrictions start to come into effect in the harbour. Right. If we're over 167 metres, we have to travel in daylight. There was fierce rivalry between Port Chalmers and Port Otago. They competed against each other, upgrading and developing their facilities to win shipping business. Port Chalmers' big win was gaining container port status in the 1970s, but Port Otago is still important, with bulk carriers and oil tankers like the Kakariki threading their way up Victoria Channel to tie up at the city's wharves. Tomorrow, the Kakariki sails for Bluff, and I'll be back aboard, but my brief stop over in Dunedin means a chance to investigate the great New Zealand shipping empire that had its roots right here. Of all the big national businesses that once had their headquarters in Dunedin, the most important was the Union Steamship Company. Launched in 1875 by the country's first shipping baron, James Mills, Union Steamship became the largest shipping line in the Southern Hemisphere, owning up to 70 ships at any one time, plus shipyards, wharves and a big head office. So we've got this huge building with flagpoles and minarets and decorations. This was really the architecture of success when the company dominated trades not just of New Zealand and Australia but across the Pacific and even went as far as the UK. Success allowed the company to run some of the fastest and most luxurious ships of their time. Because Union Steamship was so dominant it was nicknamed the Southern Octopus. So if you had to give uh, an analogy to companies today would it be like Fletcher Challenge? Fletcher Challenge and some more. I'd throw in Air New Zealand, a um, couple of other companies, maybe a fuel company and you're getting somewhere there. So it was monstrous? It was huge. It was our first multinational. Wow. James Mills was the first New Zealand-born person to be knighted. He was one of the British Empire's greatest shipping barons. But look at that photograph. Mm. As you can see, he is the one seated in the foreground. And who is standing behind him? The Prime Minister of New Zealand, Sir <laughs> Joseph Ward. It says everything about the power of the man who created the Union Steamship Company. So what's happened to the Union Steamship Company now? It's gone the full distance from Robber Baron and Dunedin Empire down to bean counters in 2001. There's one person in Auckland charged only with selling off the remnants. So there's a bit of land here and there's one very ugly barge laid up in Littleton for sale. So within a short time, the Union Company really will be history. In an even shorter time, I'll be heading further south to Stewart Island and Fiordland. The weather god.
gods are certainly smiling on us. Let's hope it stays this way. James Cook and the Endeavour had a miserable time off the Otago coast. Battered by gales, the ship was forced 150 miles offshore, and a heavy southwest swell made conditions aboard very uncomfortable. We should have a smoother trip as the Kakariki heads down the Southland coast into Fovo Strait and into the country's southernmost port, Bluff. Cook reasoned that the persistent southwest swell meant there was very little land left in front of him. There was no great southern continent, down here anyway, and the Maori of Queen Charlotte Sound were right when they told him that this was an island. And what a coastline. Magnificent. I'm reliably informed that weather like this happens about twice a year. I guess you could say we lucked in here. It's beautiful. We're just off the Catlins, which is one of the most remote parts of the Southland coast, up there at the point of the Nuggets, and these are the Catlin Hills. I don't think it's a place I'd like to be in a big southerly blow or something. Cook battled on into Fovo Strait, where these days the T.Y. Point aluminium smelter stands at the entrance to Bluff Harbour. So you can see, here we have Bluff, and out to our left is Stewart Island. Now, Cook stood a lot further out, it was really cloudy, and he could see that there was flat land all the way around the horizon, and he suspected, surmised, that it continued between the two pieces of land. So he turned left and went down round Stewart Island. He didn't know it was an island, and even when he got round the other side, he still didn't know, and he made one of his few charting mistakes and mapped it as part of the mainland. Unlike Otago Harbour, where the Kākāriki had to enter during the day, here at Bluff, entrance is dictated by the tide. Because Fovo Strait rips a strong current across the harbour mouth, we have to wait till slack water at high tide before we can come in to dock. Bright and early next morning, I'm off. The Kakariki has treated me extremely well and I wish all my new friends aboard fair sailing. My next lift is tied up alongside. She's slightly smaller. Good luck, fellas. Well, here I am in Bluff. I'm off to Stewart Island and Fjord Land aboard um, Breaksy Girl. I think I'm ready. Okay, Peter. Good day, Lance. How are you? Good. Pleased to meet you. And likewise. Cheers. Can I come aboard? Oh, you certainly may. Breaksy girl skipper Lance Shaw knows these southern waters intimately. He sailed them for over 25 years. For 12 of those years, he captained the Department of Conservation vessel Renown and now runs eco tours out of Doubtful Sound in Fiordland. Lance and Breaksy girl are taking me from Bluff down around the bottom of Stewart Island, across to the southwest coast, and into Dusky Sound. Aboard for the trip across Fovo Strait is Harold Ashwell, a descendant of the original Stewart Island iwi, Nati Rakiura. Harold continues his iwi's tradition of harvesting titi, or mutton birds. Access to the so-called mutton bird islands is allowed only during the two-month mutton birding season. It's a big expense. Yeah. to maintain a place like that just for the short time yeah. each year. But uh, they're also keeping up their tradition. Mutton birding is steeped in tradition and the strict controls on it reflect Maori conservation values. Nowadays there's a commercial aspect to the harvest and hundreds of thousands of birds can be taken in a season but literally millions are left. Hunting and preserving techniques have changed little over the years. However, nowadays, those who can wangle a helicopter ride find getting onto the islands a lot easier. Jumping ashore from the dinghy onto the rocks, uh, it, it's not a simple thing. Right. Very few islands that have a decent landing place like a beach where right. you can go ashore. There's almost no wave action here today, it's very quiet. But no, it's very quiet. But even here where the, where the houses are, the beach is, is solid rock, it's lumpy and... Uh, and the wash on uh, And that's a good place. Yeah, that's a good place, yeah. That's a good place. I've had 70, 71 seasons birding. Yeah. And uh, hope to see a few more. 
You obviously get a buzz out of it. Your eyes light up and you get all cheerful when you start talking about it. Oh, well, <laughs> it's something that's in the blood. Right. Yeah. It gets you. Once you've been birding, you just can't let it go. We drop Harold at Stewart Island's only settlement, Half Moon Bay. Thanks, Harold. You too. Yeah, very good. Safe trip, right? Yep. Cheers. By now, all aboard the Endeavour knew their search for the mythical Great Southern Continent was over, at least for the meantime. The coastline was coming to an end, and there was nothing on the horizon. Joseph Banks put it most poetically, acknowledging the total demolition of our aerial fabric called continent. Over to my right here, these huge solid granite peaks are the Fraser Peaks. The first one, the big round one that you can see is Bald Cone, and behind that is Gog and Magog. And as you can see, they are huge, muscly bits of rock. Now, when Cook and Co sailed down here, they could see them glistening in the evening sun and they thought it was quartz, and they said that there was probably a great wealth of minerals to be found here, but they were wrong because what the glistening was was water running down the smooth granite surfaces. Ahead, Cook ingeniously called the most southerly point of land, South Cape. He fixed its position before a kindly wind change allowed him at last to turn the endeavour northward. How often would it um, look like this? I mean, it's <laughs> not very often. <laughs> It's you don't know how lucky like, you are. Yeah, no, <clears throat> we've got a fair idea how lucky we are. Yeah. Well, it's not even the normal southwest roll here, you know. I mean, it's not only is there no wind, but it's, there's no roll either, really. It's brilliant. In fact, the weather's so good that there's a very rare sight. Mutton birds sitting on the water. Yeah, Harold's mutton birds. Harold's mutton birds? Yeah. <laughs> when he said he was going to take a thousand of them, I thought, that's an awful lot of birds. But when you look at this, this is just one little patch. I think the threat to these guys is uh, is not so much what they're taking in the short season down here. It's it's the food supply for them is the is the major dramas. You know, the breaking down of food chains. That's what's really going to hurt them. Captain's log, fourteenth March, seventeen seventy. This bay I have named Dusky Bay. In it are several islands, behind which there must be shelter from all winds, providing there is sufficient depth of water. The north point of this bay is very remarkable. Five high-peaked rocks, standing off like four fingers and a thumb of a man's hand, on which account I have named it Point Five Fingers. Cook hauled towards Dusky Bay, but decided it was too far to run before dark. However, three years later, he was back on his second voyage to the Pacific. This time, aboard his ship, the Resolution, Cook sailed in to explore this most remarkable place. When James Cook and his exhausted crew sailed into Dusky Sound in March 1773, the Resolution had been at sea without seeing land for nearly four months. Much of the time, they'd been freezing in sub-Antarctic waters. Coming in here on a beautiful day just like this must have been overwhelming. They fished, shot waterfowl and killed a seal for fresh meat. Cook wrote that there were great numbers of seals in the area. It didn't take long for that word to spread and for men to follow Cook's wake here to Anchor Island to slaughter the seals for their skins and fur. Here at Luncheon Cove was the first settlement by Pākehā in New Zealand in 1792, just 20 years after Cook had left. The sealers came here and stayed for 11 months. And they built a house, a wharf, and a ship. The sealers knew that it was possible that the ship that dropped them off could be wrecked somewhere. So their contingency plan was to build a schooner, 53 feet long, nearly 17 feet wide. And this was their shipyard. This is the most remarkable place to build a ship. This hole here is in fact a pit saw hole. There's a guy standing in the bottom with a saw and pushed it up and his mates stood up the top on some planks and shoved it down. And this way they sawed up and down and cut the planks necessary for the ship that they built right here. It's got a drainage hole to let the chips and the water flow down into the stream. Amazing feat of engineering. 
But you've got to admire, I think, above all, the stamina and the sheer fortitude deciding to build a ship in this place. Anyway, they did, and they launched it down there. Well, they would have launched it here, but fortunately their ship came back and they sailed away. But two years later, another ship came in here. It was a rotting old hulk called the Endeavour. No relation. And it came to grief a little later on some rocks further up the coast. The men from that ship came here, finished the one that had been left here two years earlier, and sailed it away. But before they did, they named it the Providence. Coming into Dusky Sound was also a provident move for James Cook. He wrote that he and his men were enjoying what in our situation might be called the luxuries of life. Cook decided to stay and explore, but he was unhappy with the mooring at Anchor Island, so he sent Lieutenant Pickersgill over to check out the southeast side of the Sound for a better spot. He discovered this little entranceway into a perfect little harbour, and they described the resolution as coming through here being towed in, and that the entranceway was only twice as wide as the ship was. And you can see it's pretty narrow. Cook would anchor the resolution here in Pickersgill Harbour for five weeks. Ashore, the crew built a forge to repair the ship's ironwork and erected tents for the sailmakers. On what Cook called Astronomer's Point, the bush was cleared and about a hundred big trees knocked over so an observatory could be set up. Everything came down, clear felling. Right. Everything would have come down, otherwise they couldn't, you know, pan across the sky to do what they needed to do. And this is actually the remains. So this would be one of them? This is one of the stumps, yep. Right. Yeah, there's quite a few around when you start looking around. Yeah. But these were really big old trees, and that's what I say. If you look through here, they're all missing now. So they tell me that this is the first place in New Zealand that they brewed beer. <laughs> yeah, well, old Cookie got into that, this is, and this is what he used, actually, the Rimu. And the idea of the beer, of course, was not just to get everybody tanked up, but oh. to as, a, as his fight for scurvy, because he was a... He was a world leader yeah. in, 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 in that. Yeah, good idea though. I mean, you know, any seaman will have a glass of beer. Yeah, I've heard of an, a nice oaked Chardonnay, but I don't know about a remood beer. Oh, no, well, you shouldn't knock it till you tried it. You wouldn't knock it till you tried it. <laughs> Cookie knew what he was up to. The Māori knew this area as Tamatea, and small groups of Ngāti Mamoi and Naitahu stayed occasionally. Cook first saw Māori here at Cascade Cove, they ran away, but not before inspiring Resolutions artist William Hodges. A few days later on what he called Indian Island, Cook greeted an elderly Māori man with a hongi and met his family. Koha were exchanged, a red cloak and a whalebone club. Cook visited the family over a two-week period. Then one day, they simply vanished. It's so pristine, it's easy to think nothing has changed since Cook was here, but he introduced the first foreign invaders, rats, pigs and goats. In time, deer, possums, stoats, ferrets and weasels would join the ranks of imports wreaking havoc. On Pigeon Island, one of New Zealand's unsung conservation heroes tried to do something about it. From 1894 to 1909, this lonely island was the home of Dusky Sound Ranger Richard Henry, who saw the disastrous impact that stoats and their like were having on the areas Kakapo and Kiwi. This was Henry's island sanctuary where he kept the birds he hoped to save. Henry campaigned against the government's decision to release vermin to control rabbits. And he fought a one-man battle against the consequences. Into an aviary like this, they bring animals like stoats, weasels and ferrets and expect them to eat the rabbits. Mm. Why would they do that? Yeah. Why would you go for the hard meal when there's all these easy ones. Here we are now, standing in the middle of three million acres of World Heritage National Park and listen to it, listen to the bird call. So our aviary has been demolished. Can you imagine for a moment what tourism would be in New Zealand if our birds were still here? And this is the actual pen in which Richard Henry kept his kākāpō. Right. And the purpose, of course, was to, um, you know, he was trapping birds and bringing them here and then he'd shift them from here to other islands, hopefully to keep them away from the stoats. Right. And you, know, you can imagine how he felt 
Ooh, and he oh. knew that there were stoats swimming out to the islands that he was shifting the birds to. I mean, it just must have been devastating. Yeah. In late April 1773, after a five-week stay, Cook sailed the Resolution up a northern passage, out of Dusky and into what he called Breaksea Sound. And it's here the Department of Conservation is continuing the work that Richard Henry started. On Breaksea Island, too far from the mainland for stoats to swim, the big problem was rats. Getting rid of them on this scale to establish an island sanctuary was a world first. The whole island was, was tracked, the horizontal tracks all the way, every 50 metres from, the, from here to the top, and vertical lines as well. Some of them so steep that people were hanging off ropes. Every 50 square metres. Every 50 track. square metres. Yeah. Every 50 square metres. Yeah. Yes, it was a big job. We're talking thousands of them. We had a big board up here, you know, with all the pins, with all the bait stations, and the rats were taking the bait away, you know. Yeah. And as they stopped taking the bait, we knew that that was them. They were gone, you know. Yeah. And the pins were coming out of the wall, and it was down to the last pin on the last day, and out it came, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's just brilliant. That's <laughs> what conservation's all about. It's nice to have a win now and then, you know. <laughs> Well, it's uh, 10 to 3, and uh, they've come and got me and told me that I've got to get aboard the uh, Melbourne Carrier 2 now because there's going to be a big storm, and they won't be able to do it later on, so... It feels a bit like boarding a phantom ship like the Mary Celeste, but the Melbourne Carrier 2 should have plenty of life left. As a bulk carrier transporting cement, she plays a crucial role in the country's building and construction industry. For the first time on my voyage, I'm expecting the sort of conditions that Cook and the Endeavour frequently had to handle during the so-called summer of 1770. I have an uneasy feeling of calm. Officially, we've just made it to Storm. Force 10. An economical term for one's possible demise. With winds gusting 60 to 70 knots, we've made next to no progress all night. But the Melbourne carrier is smashing on towards Westport. We have to be there by high tide tomorrow afternoon, so the focus of everyone's attention is the weather forecast. Uh, the position of the ship this morning was probably about here. Yeah. And we were getting uh, storm force northeasterlies. Excellent. The wind moves right round to the southwest. It'll be up a, a stern, and right. it won't roll so much. It's okay. just your a bit. That's all. So we can expect a certain amount of discomfort yet for a while. Yes, we will move it. Thanks very much. When conditions allow, I venture to the stern, doing my own impression of John Cleese from the Ministry of Funny Walks. I'm hoping for a glimpse of another Fiordland sound spotted from the Endeavour, one that sparked a furious argument between Cook and Banks. In the murk and gloom behind me, you can probably just make out the entrance to Doubtful Sound. It's the first thing we've seen since leaving Breaksea Island. And it was here that Cook and Banks had a bit of a set to. James Cook, being a prudent sort of sailor, decided that he wasn't going to enter Doubtful Sound, or Doubtful Harbour as he called it, because it was a lee shore. There was huge seas running, lots of wind, and it's driving him into the entrance. And he said it was doubtful whether he'd ever get out again. Banks was desperate to head off prospecting for mineral deposits, but Cook accused him of putting his own ambitions before the safety of the ship. Their relationship never really recovered from this spat, and Banks would never sail with Cook again. By early afternoon, the storm has blown past us, and I remember that I haven't eaten since the night before. Well, I haven't felt like it, to be honest. The Melbourne chef has a passion for James Cook, He's been aboard the Endeavour replica where he found the galley facilities very, very basic. They had uh, wood and coal, uh, just one virtually big pot, uh, they were cooking it on that. Quite amazing, yeah. quite amazing how, that, how it happened. I imagine breakfast this morning would have been a bit of a trick too. Quite a problem. And uh, what happens when you've been cooking for four hours and suddenly it ends up all over the deck? Don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, it's a beautiful sunset. Things have calmed down considerably. Just a little bit of rolling swell still coming in. The captain's turned into a lead foot. It's taken us flat out towards Westport. He's optimistic of making it first thing tomorrow. Captain's log, 23rd March, 1770. No country upon earth can appear with more rugged and barren aspect than this stuff. From the sea as far inland as the eye can reach, nothing is to be seen but the summits of these rocky mountains. We're now off Westport, where the pilot boat is surveying the bar at the harbour mouth. Here, this is a routine job because the safe course over this bar is always changing. Harbour master Captain David Barnes uses sophisticated hydrographic gear to map the bar and then transmits his chart directly to the Melbourne's bridge. Melbourne Carrier 2, Melbourne Carrier 2. We're just sitting outside. We've got uh, a good metre and a half swell, um, 20 knots of wind on the beam, and just a slight easterly set. Nothing that should bother you. Yeah, OK, Dave, that doesn't sound too bad. We'll uh, line up and we'll give you a call. That's right, we'll sit on your starboard side coming in there. Uh, as you can see, we're just going to the entrance to Westport Harbour and they said threading the needle in Dunedin was hard. But this is ridiculous. I mean, it's a tiny little gap. The Buller River, the fastest flowing river in the South Islands, coming out of there, guided between these two walls and out into the harbour here. There's a set running and a swell. There's less than two metres of water under the hull across the deepest part of the bar. The captain's following the channel and it's slightly unnerving when the ship lines up the portside breakwater and then seemingly at the last possible second veers to starboard and then we're through. Since 1988, the Melbourne Cement Company has managed the port because keeping it open is key to its business. Its main limestone supply is nearby at Cape Falwind, also named by Cook. The two company ships make about 150 visits each year, loading out over 450,000 tonnes of cement. The boom years of the coal trade may be over, but Westport's economic well-being still depends on keeping the port open. Nowadays, with cement, fishing and tourism, the port enables the town to continue trading on the region's natural resources. It was founded on gold and then uh, it was built on coal and the, uh, the whole of this wharf was built to bring uh, for the coal trade and then um, uh, as the coal trade died away so uh, cement started up and we're nourished by cement today. 50% of New Zealand's cement comes out of this harbour. The resources of limestone and coal on the mountains are uh, very important for, uh, for New Zealand and will continue to be so. A beautiful buller morning, and the weather forecast is encouraging for the penultimate leg of my circumnavigation of New Zealand. I'm taking a fishing boat, not an old gracious one, there's a need for speed on this leg. No, I've gone for sheer power, 2,000 horsepower to be exact, a big grunty fishing machine with the slightly incongruous name of Tranquil Image. She operates out of Nelson, and was purpose built for the rugged conditions that so often bedevil boaties off this coast. Tranquil is designed to get out to the fish as fast and as comfortably as possible and to run in the face of sudden changes of weather also as fast as possible. She's exactly the sort of boat that inspires confidence on a rather daunting stretch of water. Up here aboard the Endeavour, Joseph Banks wrote, the crew was sighing for roast beef. I know how they feel. I'm keen to get home myself. But this trip is going to be a blast. Captain's Log, 23rd March, 1770. There is great reason to believe that the same ridge of mountains extends nearly the whole length of the island. The mountains are covered in many places with large patches of snow, which perhaps have laid there since creation. On the tranquil image, I'm heading from Westport up the isolated Karamea Bight 
round Farewell Spit and onto Derville Island in the Marlborough Sounds. Cook knew the top of the island couldn't be far away, but sailing conditions were very tricky with no wind in the sails, and a powerful swell pushed the endeavour far too close to the shore for the captain's comfort. You can see the swell coming in there behind us. Now we're travelling at 22 knots. This thing's passing up and underneath us, so you can imagine the speed that it's travelling. Cook knew the Māori called the South Island Te Waipunamu, a reference to the Greenstone they would never agree to trade with the Endeavour's crew. The Māori used to travel its entire coastline in Waka, bringing the Greenstone up north. Now having been what we've just been through with the weather, you can see that it must have been a treacherous journey for those people in those flimsy little wooden dugouts. And eventually, they gave up transporting Greenstone by Walker and set up what are known as the Greenstone Trails in amongst the hills and mountains up the entire west coast. The enormous power of sea along this coast is graphically shown in the way it's eroded these promontories, creating fantastic rock sculptures. The light and manoeuvrable tranquil image gets me right in for an unforgettable close-up look. Cook knew he had almost completed circumnavigating the country. He charted a narrow spit of land at the top of the South Island. When he left these waters for home, he would call it Cape Farewell. All the sand and gravel that we've been talking about builds up along the entire west coast and ends up here on Farewell Spit. So much so that in the last 230 odd years or since Cook visited, it's doubled in size. As the Endeavour sailed round the Cape, Cook spotted Stevens Island that he'd seen from Queen Charlotte Sound two months before. Cook suspected that he was sailing past Murderer's Bay from Abel Tasman's chart, so called because it was the place where Māori warriors and Walker killed three of his sailors. Today, this is Golden Bay. Cook called it Blind Bay, but in 1827 the whole area was renamed Tasman Bay by the French explorer Dermont Deville. He also corrected Cook's chart, which showed the mainland here extending out to include what is actually an island. Cook's oversight is understandable. He wouldn't risk coming in so close to shore, so he stayed out sailing past Stevens Island and down into Admiralty Bay. We're taking the shortcut but one that includes a fearsome stretch of water where whirlpools and tidal rips lie waiting for the unwary. Derville was the first European to sail through, but only after studying the pass for three full days. First everything went well, and then all of a sudden, just as they were going through, the wind dropped completely. The ship veered to port in the current and touched the rocks. The crew started freaking out and yelling and so forth, but Dermont Derville stood there and said, no, no, we're through, and indeed he was, but the head touched and traces of the false keel off the bottom of the ship were trailing in the wake behind, but the wind had come up and it pushed them through and they made it clear. This is French Pass, which in spite of its dangers became the main shipping route to and from Nelson, and across the water, the eastern side of Derville Island, where the Endeavour anchored for the last time in New Zealand. Captain's Log, 27th March, 1770. As we have now circumnavigated the whole of this country, it is time for me to think of quitting it. But before I do this, it will be necessary to complete our water first. After the ship was moored, I sent an officer ashore to superintend the watering, and the carpenter and his crew to cut wood, while the longboat was employed carrying on shore empty casks. Locally, this is called Low Neck Bay, but given its significance in the Endeavour story, it probably deserves something more appropriate. Like some other cook sites around the country, if you didn't know it was here, you'd miss it completely. At Purangi in Mercury Bay on the Coromandel, it was great to see one of Cook's first watering places pretty much as he would have found it. This one has also survived. This beautiful little creek here is probably where Cook and his crew filled their water barrels for the last time in New Zealand. Joseph Banks set off up into these hills to find some new plant species and in fact found three more including an alpine daisy. And Cook himself set forth to explore by foot and in a rowboat. 
he found some Maori huts, some signs of habitation, but there'd been nobody there for what he thought was at least a year. Pretty little spot. There's one small acknowledgement that Cook was here, but it's a bit tricky to get to with the tide in. And here in this beautiful, sheltered, clear-watered little bay on Derville Island is one of the most isolated and little-known memorials to James Cook. And I quote, James Cook sailed the Endeavour from this bay on the 31st of March 1770, leaving New Zealand and steering west on his long homeward voyage. Cook decided to sail west home to England. On the way he chartered the entire east coast of Australia, almost coming to grief on the Great Barrier Reef. But that's another story. The Endeavour stopped in Batavia, known today as Jakarta. It was a tragic port of call. After having lost just one man on the trip so far, 27 of Cook's crew would die in this hellhole of disease. The Endeavour had circumnavigated New Zealand for six months, sailing 2,400 miles. Despite often appalling unseasonal weather, Cook's chart compared to the modern day map is astonishingly accurate. Here she comes. My first and now last lift. The spirit of New Zealand. Jim. Hi there Peter, how's it going? Oh really good mate, yourself? Oh pretty good. Good trip? Yeah, yeah, great. Good to see you again. Okay. Okay, here we go. Yep. Let's head on out. Oh. Not a bad spot to finish off, eh? Oh fantastic, eh? Just beautiful. I'm immensely grateful to live in this glorious country. I've shared stories and heartfelt warmth from Māori and Pākehā, experienced fear and beauty, boredom and laughter, memories and tears. I suppose I've suffered a sea change, as Will Shakespeare put it. And I haven't so much searched for my waka as perhaps had it reassembled around me. Mostly I'm aware how many people have helped me to understand myself better and to perhaps I don't know, sit a little easier in my own skin. And all this through the medium of the sea. The bow spread of a square rigger. Fabulous. Beautiful day. Sensational country. What a journey. I'm at seventh heaven. <laughs> James Cook devoted the last part of his log to summing up what he'd found here. His thoughts on the Māori and the potential for European colonisation were prophetic. So far as I have been able to judge of these people, it does not appear to be at all difficult for strangers to form a settlement in this country. By kind and gentle usage, the colonists would be able to form strong parties among them. Was this country settled by an industrious people? they would very soon be supplied not only with the necessaries, but many of the luxuries of life. He came, he saw, he charted. One of the greatest sailors of all time. His voyage on the endeavour changed the destiny of a whole country. My country. New Zealand. And one thing I've learned for certain. We live in paradise. Thanks, mate.
This program was made with funding from New Zealand on air.